Hey everybody, welcome to the next lecture, which is going to be the beginning um, of the digestive system. It's going to be one of two lectures on the digestive system. Uh, so let's get right into it. So most nutrients that we eat are not actually used in the existing forms that they are in, in our digestive system. Okay. So what that means is you don't eat a, you don't use a hamburger in the hamburger state so to speak, okay? What you do is you take the components that make up a hamburger or make up whatever it is that you're eating and you break them down into usable forms that we call nutrients, right? And the digestive system acts as a, a disassembly line, okay? So not an assembly line where it puts things together, but it takes them apart into their smaller pieces. So you take a protein, you disassemble it into its smaller parts, you take a carbohydrate, you disassemble it into its smaller parts, so on and so forth. Uh, to break down nutrients into forms that can be used by the body is what we want to do, right? We want to take these large molecules, okay? We want to take very large, you know, pieces of meat or, or plant-based material or whatever. And we want to break those down into its smaller units, okay? Like simple sugars and amino acids and things like that. Okay, that's, that's what our digestive system wants to do. Um, we want to break them down into nutrients. That's what we want to, we want to get usable nutrients, and then we want to absorb those usable nutrients and then distribute those nutrients to our various tissues. Okay, so the nutrients that we have, the sugars, the proteins, the amino acids, things like that, we want to give them to our heart cells and our liver cells and our muscle cells and things like that. Okay, uh, the study of the of the digestive tract and the diagnosis and treatments of disorders of the digestive tract is called gastroenterology. So if you had some type of issue with your um, digestive system, you would go see a gastroenterologist. Okay, which is pretty self-explanatory. Okay, we have uh the digestive system itself is an organ system that processes food. It extracts nutrients and eliminates residue. Okay. You can probably assume you know what residue is. Okay. That is feces, right? Uh, there are five major stages of digestion. The first thing, and, and a lot of people don't really, you know, think about all of these five things when they when they think about digestion they they kind of just think that of the of this part they think about the breakdown of food uh they, they don't really think about all this other stuff which we're going to talk about so ingestion uh is the intake of food okay it's when you actually put food into the digestive system you know starting at the mouth and putting it into your uh, esophagus and, and stomach and things like that once it's in your digestive system you then do digestion and digestion has two different types. You can have mechanical digestion or you can have chemical digestion. Okay. Mechanical is the, the physical breakdown of food, right? With, um, with your teeth. That's a good example of mechanical digestion. When your stomach churns, when your digestive, when your uh, intestines move around and churn, that's physically mushing food up into smaller parts. And then you have chemical breakdown of food which is the use of things like enzymes to break large chemicals chemically down into smaller chemicals. Okay. Once you digest the food that you eat, okay, you absorb it. Okay. You, and what absorption means, that's the uptake of nutrients into epithelial cells and then eventually into the blood and into the lymph tissue. Okay. So it initially goes into the epithelial of the digestive tract. And then once it's in the digestive tract it can then be put or diffuse into the blood or diffuse into the lymph, depending on where it's needed. Okay. Once it gets to a certain portion of your lower digestive tract or digestive system, uh, compaction uh, occurs. And compaction is when you absorb water and you consolidate the ingestible, in the indigestible residue of feces into feces. Okay. So um, when it, when food particles that you didn't use and water enter your large intestine, it's kind of like sludge, right? It's this, it's very liquidy, sludgy, 
um, kind of material. Once it gets into your large intestines, that's where most of the water absorption occurs. It's going to compact that by removing the water. What you're left with is solids. And when you put those solids together, you have solid feces, solid waste. Okay. And then you defecate. Okay. Defecation is the elimination of feces. Okay. It's the elimination or, or the ridding your body of fecal matter. Okay. Okay. Uh, mechanical digestion, like I said previously, is the physical breakdown of food into smaller particles. We can do this by cutting into our food and grinding into our food with our teeth. We can do that by churning our food with our stomach and our small intestines. Um, and the whole point of mechanical digestion is to increase surface area. Very, very important. Okay. You want to increase surface area because the more surface area you have, the more the enzymes are going to be able to work. So I like to use an example, like if we have, oh, that's a terrible square. How awful is that? Okay. If you have a, a block of ice, right? And this block of ice is, you know, a one foot cube. So every side of this cube is one foot wide. And you had two of these, okay, two exact copies of this cube of ice, same volume, same size, whatever. And you had one, you had them both in the same room at the same temperatures on, on a table, right? Both these are on uh, an exactly the same table. All the, all the variables are the same. The only thing that's going to change is I'm going to take one of these and I'm going to chop it up into pieces. I still have the same amount of ice on this table. It's just not in a cube form anymore. It's in these tiny little bits. So this ice cube turns into, here's on my table, instead of it being a large block, it's little chips of ice, right? All piled on top of one another. Okay, still the same amount of ice as this one, but it's in small, tiny little pieces. Which one of these is gonna melt first? Is, is the large block gonna melt first or are these little chips gonna melt first? Okay, if you said B, you are correct. Okay, the little chips on the table are gonna melt at a much, much quicker rate than the large block because there's more surface area being exposed, right? There are parts of this, the only surfaces that are being exposed to the air are the outside surfaces of this cube, right? Of this block of ice. The inside of this block of ice is not being exposed, right? Only the exposed surfaces, okay? Here, when we chop it all up, there were pieces, there are pieces of this chip that were inside the ice cube that wouldn't normally be exposed to the air, but now are exposed to the air because we chopped it up into pieces. Okay. So that's the same thing if you do that to your food. If you have a hamburger, right? So here's a hamburger patty, or let's just say it's a patty or a piece of chicken or whatever, it doesn't matter. Okay. And I have an enzyme. Okay. An enzyme is a chemical that is going to help chemical digestion. Okay. Uh, and that enzyme only touches the surface of my hamburger and digest the, the outside of the hamburger, okay, uh, it would only be able to digest the outermost covering. But now let's see what happens when I, when I chew that hamburger, right? If I chew that hamburger into tiny little pieces, I still have the same amount of hamburger, still the same amount of meat that I was chewing or that I ate or took a bite of before, but now instead of only being the outside being digested, I can cover all the surfaces of these different little tiny pieces. And I guarantee you, if I add up all the green lines that I'm drawing around all these little pieces, they're gonna be way more than this line that I drew around this one. Okay, so I'm gonna cover more surface area. So that's, that's the point of uh, that's why we mechanically digest. We want to mechanically digest so we can increase the surface area of our um, food to be digested. Okay. So chemical digestion is, is, is going to happen in conjunction with mechanical, right? Um, and it's a series of hydrolysis reactions, hydrolysis, okay, hydrolysis. Whoops, let me go back. Okay, hydrolysis is what we do to break down um, bonds in uh, polymers. Okay, a polymer 
a polymer is a compound made of many smaller parts. That's what poly means. Poly means many, right? So polymers are made of monomers. Mono means one, right? So if you put two monomers together, right? Here's a monomer and here's a monomer. You put them together, you get yourself a polymer. Okay, if that makes sense. Okay, so chemical digestion is a series of hydrolysis reactions that breaks molecules up into monomers. So if we have this, if we have, you know, block number one, and we add a, uh, a chemical digestion enzyme, we'll write ENZ, we add that to it. So here's our polymer. We're going to get a, we're going to get two monomers after we add our enzyme. That enzyme does hydrolysis. Okay, what hydrolysis means, hydro means water, lysis means to break, All right? So we break this bond by using water, okay? The opposite of hydrolysis is called dehydration, synthesis. And that's how we put monomers together. So if we wanna add, we wanna put monomers together Okay, we dehydrate or we remove water. And by removing water, that's going to allow these two things to bond into something larger, okay, or make something larger. That's what synthesis means, right? Synthesis means to make. Dehydrate means to remove water or to remove hydration. Okay, dehydration synthesis, we put these two things together by removing water. If we want to take it apart, right, we want to start with a polymer and we want to break it up into its monomers okay we use water and we input water we'll put water into it here we took water out here we put water back in okay so chemical digestion is hydrolysis that breaks macromolecules large molecules large molecules into monomers okay or these simple one um, compound pieces here Okay, uh, these are carried out by digestive enzymes, like this, that's what I set up here, enzymes. Okay, um, some of these enzymes are produced in your saliva. Okay, some of them are produced in your stomach, some are produced in your pancreas, some are produced in your small intestines. And this is, these are the polymers, okay, this, all of these here, whoops, let me erase that, that was sloppy. Here, okay, all of these things here, These are my polymers, okay? Polysaccharides, many sugars, okay? Proteins are, polysac are uh, polymers made of smaller things. Fats are made of smaller things. Nucleic acids are made of smaller things. Okay, you should have learned this in either, uh, you know, um, anatomy one or uh, a biology course, okay? Over here are my monomers, okay? On this side, these are my monomers. Okay, and a polysaccharide, the polymer is made of monosaccharides, the monomers, right? So if you take a bunch of monomers, you put them together, you get a polysaccharide. Okay, you, get a, you put a bunch of monosaccharides together, you get a polysaccharide. Amino acids, these are monomers. You put an amino acid together with another amino acid, you get a protein, okay? Um, in lipids or fats, Okay, you have something called glycerol or glycerides, okay? And you put a glyceride together with a fatty acid, and that gives you a lipid, okay, or a fat. Okay, nucleotides. Nucleotides are what make up our DNA. DNA is a nucleic acid, right? So these simple monomers become polymers when you add them together, okay? But this is what we want to break them down into. We, we eat polysaccharides in the form of corn in the form of bread in the form of rice and we break them down into things like glucose proteins we eat albumin and egg whites okay or in eggs and we break that protein down into amino acids uh fats okay we eat you know bacon um and and fats on bacon or any type of you know meat okay meat's gonna have a lot of protein in it but it's also gonna have lots of fat in it because it comes from an animal Okay, and we break those fats up into monoglycerides or triglycerides, right? If you have a high fat diet, you're going to have a high triglyceride level. 
And we can actually eat DNA of other organisms and we can break the DNA down into nucleotides and we can reuse those nucleotides when we need to make our own DNA. Okay. Some nutrients though, don't need to be broken down, right? All of these things need to be broken down. Polysaccharides need to be broken down, proteins, fats, and like that. They all need to be broken down into their monomers in order to be used. Some nutrients do not need to be broken down anymore. Um, and they are usable in the ingested form. So they are fine. Once you put them in your mouth, they're good to go. And they can be directly absorbed into your bloodstream without any need of digestion in this manner. Examples of those are vitamins, okay? Vitamin A, D, E, K, B, C, all the vitamins that you eat in your, uh, in your food get directly absorbed into your system. Amino acids. Now, if I just mentioned amino acids up here, and amino acids are monomers, right? Now, proteins are made of amino acids. So if you eat a protein, it must be broken down into an amino acid in order to uh, get absorbed immediately. However, you can eat straight up amino acids, okay? If you've ever gone to a gym and you've, uh, you know, went to the counter afterwards and said, can I have a protein shake? Or if you've ever had a protein shake in your life, they're not actually protein shakes. They're actually amino acid shakes. If you look at the content of the back of the bottle of the powder, the protein powder, okay, quotes, um, there's no actual proteins in it. There's just tons of amino acids. They call them protein shakes because it rolls off the tongue better than, can I have an amino acid shake, chocolate amino acid shake, please? Okay, it doesn't roll off the tongue as well. Okay, minerals, okay, zinc, iron, okay, any, any mineral that you see on the side of like a cereal box um, is going to be uh, able to be ingested and absorbed. Cholesterol, okay, cholesterol is one of those things that doesn't need to be broken down. It's something that can be used uh, as soon as you uh, intake it. And water. Okay, water is always going to be one of those things that is going to be used immediately. Okay. okay, there are two major divisions of the digestive system. Okay, one is the alimentary canal or the digestive tract. And the other one is the accessory organs to that alimentary canal. Okay. Your digestive tract itself is a 30 foot long muscular tube that extends from your mouth all the way to your anus. Okay. So if you took a ruler and measured from your mouth to your anus, it would probably be maybe two and a half feet. Okay. Maybe three feet. Okay. From mouth to anus, if you were just to make a straight line. Um, however, it's not a straight line. Okay. Your mouth, your throat, your stomach, your small and large intestines are bent structures, they, they, they curve left, they curve right, they curve up, they curve down, okay? So you can fit a ton of intestinal tissue into your gut, okay? And, and the majority of this 30 feet is going to be intestine. There's about 25 feet of intestine out of that 30 total feet that you have in the digestive tract, okay? The organs that are present are the mouth, the pharynx, the esophagus, the stomach, small intestine and large intestine. The gastrointestinal tract or the GI tract is just the stomach and just the intestines. Okay. There are some organs that help the alimentary canal in the process of digestion. And that is going to be the teeth, the tongue, salivary glands, the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. Now the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas are accessory organs because food does not travel through them. That's why they are not part of the alimentary canal. Okay, food directly goes through the stomach, the small and large intestines. It does not directly pass through the liver because the liver is a solid organ. Same thing with the pancreas and same thing with the, the to, a, to a degree, the gallbladder. It's, it's not a hollow organ necessarily, but it, uh, it does not have food go through it directly at all. Okay, here is a picture of all of the uh, organs of the digestive tract. We start with the mouth. We have our esophagus, stomach, small, large intestines, gallbladder, liver, okay, appendix, okay, spleen, okay, all those things. All right. And we're going to take a look at all these in order. We're going to start at the mouth. We're going to work our way down, okay, until we get to the end. 
Okay. Um, one thing we want to talk about prior to getting into the different parts of the um, digest system is what what controls digestion. Okay. The digestion isn't something you necessarily think about, right? You don't think about digestion. Um, it kind of just happens uh, all the time without you having to think about it. Uh, it's produced or the movement of your digestive system is produced by enteric nervous system, which is a nervous network, which we find in the esophagus, the stomach, intestines. And that nervous system is going to help regulate the motility, okay, the movement of your digestive system because your digestive system does move. Um, it regulates secretions of enzymes, okay, all the enzymes that we're going to talk about that get produced by um, it, by your mouth and your stomach and intestines are all going to be regulated by your enteric nervous system. And the flow of blood through your digestive system is also going to be regulated by that. Okay, it's thought to have over 100 million neurons, so there's lots of uh, nervous system activity in the digestive system. It can function independently of the central nervous system. So you don't have to think about digestion in order for it to occur, right? It's it's autonomic. It's part of your autonomic nervous system. It's not something that you necessarily control. It's kind of unconscious, right? So when you eat a hamburger, you don't have to go thinking about um, digesting that hamburger. You can just go about your normal life and your digestive system will deal with the fact that you have a hamburger in your system. Okay. <clears throat> Um, the, the digestive system has a couple of, um, anatomical features that we want to talk about. And two of them are going to be the mesenteries and the omentum. Okay. The mesenteries is a piece of connective tissue that suspends the stomach and the intestines from the abdominal wall. Okay. It's, it's looseness allows stomach and intestines to undergo strenuous contractions with the freedom of movement in the uh, abdominal cavity. So we, it, the mesenteries keep your digestive organs or your organs of your gut in place, but it also allows them to move in ways that they need to move in order to accommodate digestion, okay? Uh, they hold the abdominal viscera in proper relationship to each other, okay? Basically, that means that it's not going to allow your organs to kind of switch places with each other because that could lead to problems, right? If your stomach kind of moved and, you know, got into the place of the liver and the liver had to shift over because of that, it would, it would, it would cause issues, right? So we don't want organs kind of getting out of where they should be because that can bother other organs. And then once you bother, once you stop organs from uh, doing the things that they're supposed to do, then it's like a domino effect. It, it just ruins one thing after another, after another. Uh, it's going to prevent the intestines from being twisted and tangled, okay, by changes in position, okay? When you stand up straight, when you lay down, when you roll over, when you, you know, play a sport and you're jumping around, your body position is constantly changing all the time. And if you didn't have mesenteries, your large intestines would kind of get tangled like, like an old corded phone. If you've ever seen a phone that had a phone cord on it, okay, uh, it's not... It's not fun to take the knots out of a corded phone, okay? And the same thing for you. It would not be fun for you to have a tangled up digestive system uh, or tangled up intestines because that could block, you know, waste from getting out of your body and that could lead to, you know, uh, kind of like a poisoning. Okay, the mesenteries also provides blood vessels and nerves to supply the digestive tract. And it contains many, many, many lymph nodes. We saw that from the, the previous chapter on the lymphatic system. The omentums, the lesser omentum is a ventral mesentery that extends from the lesser curvature of the stomach, which I'll show you, to the liver. So it kind of connects the liver and the stomach together, again, keeping them in the places that they need to be. We don't want our stomach to fall or drop too far down into the abdomen, and the lesser omentum is going to help that from happening or prevent that from happening. The greater omentum is, is more like, um, kind of like an apron. Okay. Um, and it, it hangs from the greater curvature of the stomach. And I'll show you what that means in a moment. Um, and it covers the entirety of the small intestine below the stomach, kind of like an apron, like I said before. Okay. Uh, this is the body's first line of defense against toxins and infections. And let me show you a picture of it. OK, 
Okay, let's go forward one more time. Okay, so take a look at this picture and then we'll go back a slide. Okay, here is the lesser omentum. Okay, and this lesser omentum is going to connect the lesser curvature of the stomach. That's this curvature right here. Okay. Okay, the, whoops. The greater curvature of the stomach is the other curvature on the outside of the stomach. Okay, because it's bigger, right? This curvature is lesser. And it connects that to the to the liver. Here is my greater omentum. Okay, this big yellow kind of net. Kind of looks like a fishing net, but it's yellow. It looks like fatty. Okay, and you can see the arteries running through it, the blood supply running through it. And this hangs over the intestine. It's not actually part of the intestine. It's hung over the intestine. And the next picture I show you will be this greater momentum lifted up. Okay, so if we lift up the greater momentum, we lift this straight up. Okay, let me get a pen here. Okay, if we take this from the bottom and we lift it up this way, okay, what we see is this, right? We've lifted it up this way. Oops. And we've lifted it up this way. And underneath, what you see is the small intestines, the large intestine is this area here. Okay. And what we see in between the large intestine and the small intestine are the mesenteries. Okay. You can see all the arteries and veins network in there. Okay. And that's going to keep our intestines from tangling as well as the, the greater momentum as well. Okay. So we have something called the mesocolon. Okay. And, uh, and it was mentioned on this slide over here, but I never mentioned it. Okay. The inner superior margin of the greater momentum forms membranes around the spleen and the transverse colon, which is what we call the mesocolon. Okay. Um, so if we take a look here, the mesocolon is an extension of the mesenteries and anchors the colon to the abdominal wall. Okay, so this colon, where are we? This colon here, okay, is our transverse colon, okay, is going to be anchored to the abdominal wall so that it doesn't move around and get out of place. Okay, we don't want that to happen. Okay, when something is intraperitoneal, that means that an organ is enclosed by mesenteries on both sides. Okay, the stomach, the liver, and parts of the small and large intestine are all inter, intraperitoneal. And when something is retroperitoneal, that's when an organ lies against the posterior of the body wall and is covered by peritoneum on its anterior side only. Okay, so that typically means just basically it's behind the, perite the peritoneum. Okay, um, it's the duodenum is one of those, and that's going to be part of your small intestines, your pancreas is one of the organs that is considered retroperitoneal and some parts of the large intestine are also going to be considered retroperitoneal okay again here's our picture there's our mesenteries here's our omentums okay be able to label these on an exam okay so now we're going to start going through the actual digestive system itself we're going to start at the mouth we're going to work our way all the way through to the anus Okay, the mouth is known as the oral cavity or the buccal cavity. The buccal, the term buccal comes from a, a muscle called the buccinator muscle, which is in the mouth. Okay, and it's going to be one of the uh, muscles that help you chew, and we'll talk about that later too. Functions of the mouth is to be uh, ingestion. Okay, it's going to do ingestion or take food in. It's going to taste things, right? Our mouth helps us to taste things in response to the food. It helps us chew. And that's going to be mechanical and chemical digestion in the mouth. Okay, there's uh, saliva that we produce. That's the chemical. And then the chewing uh, is the mechanical. It's going to uh, help us to swallow. It's going to help us talk. Okay, make speech. And it's going to help us respire, which means take in oxygen, right? O2. Okay, the mouth is enclosed by your cheeks, your lips, your palate, and your tongue. Okay, all of those things are enclosed in your mouth. Okay, the space between your lips, the anterior opening between your lips actually has a name. It's called the oral fissure. Okay, oral fissure. Okay, stratified squamous epithelium lines the mouth. If you remember way back when, uh, to like the third or fourth chapter of the first semester of anatomy. Okay, we learned about different... Um, 
epithelial cells and stratified squamous are going to line the mouth. Uh, the areas of your mouth that that are subject to high food abrasion, which means that air, there are certain parts of your mouth that come into contact with food more than other parts of your mouth, uh, such as your gums. Your gums come into a lots of contact with food and your hard palate. Your hard palate is the, the roof of your mouth and the front of your mouth, right, like, right behind your teeth on the roof of your mouth. Those areas come into lots of contact with food, so they need to be a little bit tougher um, so that they don't get damaged as easy. Uh, and we call that toughness, we call that keratinization. Okay, so that means that they're keratinized. Keratin is a, uh, you know, a, a hard protein uh, that's kind of made when cells are like, um, uh, are kind of dying, right? Your, your skin cells have lots of keratin in them. Okay, which means they're basically dead cells and they're a little bit more tougher than normal. Okay, there are plenty of parts of your mouth that are non-keratinized. Okay, the floor of your mouth, like underneath your tongue, if you get a sharp piece of food that hits underneath your mouth, on the underneath your tongue that hurts right okay your soft palate which is the the roof of your mouth in the back closer to your throat inside your cheeks and lips okay if you've ever bit down and bit your cheek by accident that's never fun okay same thing with your lips okay those are non-keratinized areas okay here's a picture of the mouth and we're going to talk about lots of the stuff in here as we go along but um, here's our hard palate, soft palate's more in the back, okay? We don't necessarily have to know any of these things right now. We're going to learn about the uvula. We're going to learn about the frenulum, okay, in a moment. Okay, so your lips are divided into three areas, okay? We, we have the cutaneous area of the lips, which is going to be the same skin tone or color as the rest of your face, okay? That's like where a mustache would grow on a person. Okay, that would be the, the cutaneous parts of the lips. Uh, they have hair follicles, so they can grow hair, like I just said, and they have sebaceous glands, which are oil glands uh, that are gonna help you know, produce oil onto, the, onto that facial hair. Then we have the area that uh, everyone thinks about when they think of lips. It's the vermilion area. Okay, vermilion is like, you know, it's the name of a color or maybe the color is the name of the, of the lips. Okay, whatever came first. Okay, but that is the red portion of your lips. That's the, the part that you kiss somebody with. Okay, it's hairless. Uh, it's the region where your lips meet. The reason it's so red is because of dermal papilla that are very close to the surface. Okay, so these dermal papilla, which have lots of blood vessels, are going to be very, very close to the surface, which give the appearance of this really red, uh, pinkish color uh, of your lips. If they were lower, if these dermal papilla weren't as tall, then your lips wouldn't be as red, okay? But they are red. They're much more sensitive than the cutaneous area is this section. And then you have the labial mucosa. This is the inner surface of the lips. This is the part of the lips that face the teeth and face your gums. And actually, they, they touch your teeth and touch your gums as well. Okay. Your tongue is a muscular bulky but very agile organ, okay? It, it can move in lots of different ways. Even though it's big and bulky, uh, you can ha have very fine motor movements with your tongue. Uh, that's evident by the speech that we have. That's evident by the fact that we can whistle and make certain noises. We have lots of um, different types of vocalizations that we use, and a lot of it is due to, to our tongue moving in certain directions. Your tongue is going to manipulate your teeth, uh, the food between your teeth, okay? The food... Food doesn't just go in your mouth and stay in one spot. Food moves all over your mouth, and your tongue is going to help move that food from one part of your mouth to another in order for you to uh, properly uh, digest it mechanically. It senses taste, and it also senses texture, right? So you can tell if something's sweet or sour or bitter, but you can also tell if something's watery or slimy or or creamy or something like that, right? Um. The, you have non-keratinized stratified squamous covering the surface of your tongue. And you have something called linguinal papillae. Linguinal papillae are these little bumps and projections on your tongue that uh, hold your taste buds. Okay, so those linguinal papillae hold your taste buds on your tongue. You can break up the tongue into two major portions. The first two-thirds of the tongue is called the body, and it occupies the oral cavity. So uh, from, from your lips... Basically, to where your teeth end is your oral cavity, 
and that's where two thirds of the tongue is going to be located. The last one third of the tongue, which is going to occupy the oropharynx, which is basically the end of your teeth to your throat. Okay, that's where the last one third of your tongue is going to be. Not a lot of people think about that their tongue goes all the way that far back, but your tongue is very big and it goes all the way basically to the edge of your throat. Okay, uh, much further than you would think it goes. And I'm going to show you a picture of that in a moment. Okay, you have a lingual frenulum. And frenulum, the frenulum is like if you lift your tongue up and look underneath your tongue, you see this little uh, line of, of tissue that connects your tongue to the bottom of your mouth. Okay, and, or the floor of your mouth. That's called the frenulum. Okay, your tongue has two sets of muscles called intrinsic and extrinsic muscles. The intrinsic ones are entirely within the tongue. That's why they're called intrinsic. And they can produce subtle movements of the tongue to give you to help you with speech. And the intrinsic muscles uh, are attached outside uh, in the tongue. And they produce stronger movements of food manipulation. Okay, and all these, these are all different types of muscles that are examples of extrinsic muscles. The hyoglossus, palatoglossus, styloglossus, okay? Those are all muscles that are going to attach to your skeleton. Okay, this one attaches to your styloid bone of your skull. This one um, to your palate, your hard palate is a, is a bone. Okay, your hyoid, okay, things like that. All right. Okay, here's the tongue. So this this is an interesting view. So you're 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 looking if if you took off the top half of someone's head. Right. If, if you were to like, um, you all know what a guillotine is, right? You put a guillotine, a head into a guillotine and it chops the head off. So you have a, a top half and a, and a body half. Right. But just imagine instead of the neck going in like where the where the guillotine would, would chop, uh, make believe like um, the guillotine would go through your head at the at the level of your your mouth, right? So the, the top teeth have been taken away and you're looking down into this person's head. Okay, this is the front of the tongue. This is the throat of the tongue over here or the throat of the of the person over here. And here is the, the tongue. This is the part that's inside your oral cavity, the body. So that's where your teeth would end. And then behind that is the the root of the tongue or that last one third of the tongue, which goes back pretty far. Here's the epiglottis, which, you know, closes over the trachea when you swallow food. Okay, the palate separates the oral cavity from the nasal cavity. All right, we don't want food getting into our sinuses, and we don't want um, what's in our sinuses necessarily getting into our mouth when, when we don't have to have it. Okay, it, uh, your palate makes it possible to breathe while you're chewing. You have a hard bony palate, like I said before, and that's on the anterior portion and supported by the palatine process of the maxilla and the palatine bones. So the, the hard palate is made of the palatine process of the maxilla and the palatine bones. Your soft palate is posterior to your hard palate with a much more spongy texture. It's made of tissue, okay? It's uh, composed of skeletal muscle and glandular tissue. There is no bone there. So when someone decomposes, their soft palate decomposes with them. Their hard palate will stay because it's bone. Okay. The uvula is that little bag that hangs in the top uh, back of your throat. Um, it is visible from the mouth and it helps to uh, keep food in the mouth until you're ready to swallow. Okay. So um, we don't want food prematurely going down into our throat if we're not ready to swallow it. Uh, that's how some things can end up in the, the airways, and we don't want that. Okay, let's talk about some teeth. Okay, dentition. Uh, dentition is the actual scientific name for teeth. Okay, masticate. Okay, the term masticate is the term that we use for chewing. So mastication is the act of chewing. Okay, and what do you chew? You chew food into small pieces. It makes it easier to swallow. That's number one, right? So you want to chew things just so you don't choke, okay? Because your esophagus is not that wide and you can't, you know, chew something wider than, you can't swallow something wider, wider than your esophagus because it'll get stuck in there, right? It's like putting a golf ball in a, in a garden hose, okay? It, it won't go through, it won't pass through. 
because it's too wide for the for the hose itself. Excuse me. Okay. Um, you also chew to expose more surface area for the action of digestive enzymes, speeding up chemical digestion like we talked about earlier. Okay. Let's talk about our teeth. We have 32 adult teeth. 16 in the bottom jaw or the mandible, 16 in the maxilla or your upper jaw. Uh, if we're talking from the midline to the rear, so we're going to start in the middle of the mouth and then work our way left and right. Okay, we have two sets of incisors. We have one set of canines. We have two sets of premolars. And we have three sets of molars. Okay, all your teeth do different things. And their shapes are going to basically determine what they do. Okay, your incisors are just like chisels. And they're used to like bite food off um, or tear food from one piece to another. Uh, your canines, those are like the, you know, the, the fangs that you have. Okay, those very pointed uh, teeth that you have. They act to puncture and shred food. And then your molars, all your molars kind of do the same thing. There are these law, large, broad, flat teeth that help to shred and grind and crush things, okay? So they're all gonna do different things. And it all depends on your diet, right? So if you're a, an animal that is a herbivore and you, you only eat plant material, you're gonna have majority of your teeth are gonna be molars, okay? If you are a uh, meat eater, okay, there's gonna be a lot more of your teeth that are used for shredding and puncturing, okay? And not necessarily for, um, for grinding like so like if you had a shark, okay, sharks have way more like canine looking teeth, much more pointed teeth than say, I don't know, a hippo who's going to survive on grass or a cow who's going to survive on grass and wheat and things like that. Okay, so let's talk about um, parts of the tooth and parts of the, the joint of the tooth. Okay, the alveolus. The alveolus is the socket in the bone. Okay, so there's a there, you have a jawbone, and there's a hole in the jawbone called the alveolus, and that's where the bone, that's where the tooth sits in. Okay, the joint that it produces. Okay, remember that you know, like if you have a hip, a hip bone or hip joint, is the connection between the acetabulum of one bone and the head of the femur, right? The acetabulum of the pelvis and the head of the femur, they come together. Uh, to form the hip joint, right? So a tooth and an alveolus forms a joint called a gomphosis. Oops, sorry about that. Okay, it forms a joint called a gomphosis. The periodontal ligament is going to be a ligament that helps to anchor the tooth into the alveolus. Okay, so just like other um, joints that you have, there are going to be ligaments there to help keep those two um, things together. It does allow slight movement under pressure of chewing. Okay, so it's not completely rigid. And then your gums are called the gingiva. And the gingiva covers all of the bone of the mandible and maxilla and the alveolar. Okay, the, the joints or the, the holes in the bones where the teeth are in the sockets. So on the left-hand side of this, we have baby teeth. On the right hand side, we have adult permanent teeth. And we can see that the numbers are different between the two. Okay, in the baby teeth, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, as opposed to 16 on the adult side. So we have 10 and 16. Okay, so let's just look at the adult one first. Okay, so we have two sets of incisors. So here's set number one, here's set number two. Okay. And there are, they are all numbered, okay? So these four teeth are all gonna be chisel shaped that help you bite into things and separate pieces of food. And then you have your canines here, okay? You have one set of canines. And those canines are gonna be like the fangs, gonna help puncture things. Then we have our first molars. Okay, one set of first molars, one set of pre of uh, second molars. And then we have our three sets of molars, okay? These are premolars, one set of premolars, two sets of premolars, and then three sets of molars. The third set of molars is called your wisdom teeth, OK? 
Okay, so that last one is called your wisdom teeth. And we'll talk about more of that those in a moment. Let's take a look at the, the child's uh, teeth. Okay, we have incisor, 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 incisor. So we still have our two pairs of incisors. Same thing so far with the adult. Then we have our canines. Same thing again. Okay, so right up to here, everything is the same as far as a child and an adult. Then we go right to first molar, right? So we're skipping the premolars. There's no premolars. No premolars. Okay, no premolars. And no third molars. Third molars gone. Okay, so no wisdom teeth for kids. Okay, once they reach adults, they can have wisdom teeth, but when they're kids, they're not going to. So we have to account, we have to account for six extra teeth when we're an adult, right? So is one, two, three, four. That's four teeth right there that we accounted for. Two first premolars, two second premolars. And then we have our third molar, which is tooth five and tooth six that is absent from here. Now remember, this is um, lower and upper jaw. Okay, so it's the same thing. This exact pattern for a child would be the same on the top and on the bottom. This exact pattern for an, uh, an adult would be the same uh, top or bottom of the jaw. Okay, so it's 16 teeth in this picture, but we have, you know, two jaws, an upper and a lower. It would be the same for both. So uh, it would be 32. Okay, some more regions of the teeth. Okay, we have the crown of the tooth, which is the portion above the gum. We have the root, which is the portion below the gum. We have the neck. The neck is where uh, the point where the crown, root, and gum meet together. Okay, so you'll see it's kind of like, uh, it's almost like a peanut. So here's the top of the tooth, comes down, that's above, that's going to be our crown. And then it kind of meets at the, at the gum and becomes like these little legs. And that's our tooth, right? This area here is going to be the neck. Okay, that'll be the neck. Okay, then we have the gingival sulcus, which is the space between the tooth and gum. So over here would be a gum, right? All of this would be gum. And the space between here is the gingival sulcus. Okay, hygiene in the sulcus is very important to your dental health. If plaque gets too uh, caked up in there, you can lead to, to dental problems. Okay, dentin. Okay, dentin is, the, is hard yellowish tissue that makes up most of your tooth. Okay, the majority of your tooth is going to be called dentin. Okay, the outside of your tooth is covered, or the, the crown and the neck is covered with what we call enamel. And enamel you cannot regenerate. So once you get rid of enamel, it stays gone. If you, if you get enamel removed from your teeth by drinking certain things or eating certain things, um, it's going to uh, be, it's going to make your teeth very sensitive. Okay, when you lose the enamel, it kind of helps, the enamel helps protect your teeth from sensitive temperatures and things like that. So if you lose enamel, you might be very sensitive to um, cold liquids, things like that. Okay, there's cement, what we something we call cement that covers the root of your tooth. Uh, and you can also call it cementum. Okay, so cementum and dentin, okay, are living tissues that can regenerate. So you can you can regenerate dentin, but you cannot regenerate enamel, and you can regenerate uh, cementum. Okay, the root canal, a lot of people think of root canal as a procedure, it, and it is, okay, but the root canal is actually an anatomical space in the, a root, which leads to what we call the pulp cavity in the crown, <clears throat> excuse me. And in the root canal is where you find nerves, where you find blood vessels for that particular tooth, and that's why it hurts to get a root canal, because it hits nerves, it hits blood vessels, and it is painful. When you put your teeth together, when you when you uh, close your mouth and put your teeth together, that is the process of occlusion. Okay. Here is the tooth. Okay, we can see the enamel here. This big like, white area here is the enamel. If you wear this away over time, uh, you can get cavities. Right, you get cav cavities in the enamel. Okay, so you would have a. So I've got a pen here. Okay, if you had a cavity in your enamel at the top, you would have a divot here. Okay, part of this enamel would be worn away and you'd have a hole. Okay, and what they do is they take some type of uh, fake material, synthetic material, and they will fill that hole. 
with that synthetic material. And that's what a filling is, right? A filling is supposed to mimic the surface of your tooth. And if you ever notice, it feels really odd after you get a filling because it's not the, it doesn't match the shape that it was before. And then after you eat a while, you kind of, you kind of chisel this into the right shape naturally by eating certain foods and things like that. Okay. Here's the dentin. Okay. This is the majority of the tooth. That's the dentin. This is the pulp cavity. Okay. This is where you, this is um, when you get a root canal, they drill into the pulp cavity in order to kind of rip the roots out of it. Okay. Uh, here's the gingival sulcus. That's where the, the, the gum meets. That's the space between the gum and the tooth itself. Here's the gum, which is called the gingiva. Okay, this is bone of the, of the jaw. This could be mandible or maxilla bone. Here is the root canal on either side. And that's going to be the canal where your roots go, where the arteries, veins, and nerves go. Okay, here's our cement, which is this outer covering of the bone. Okay, root, neck, crown, we got all that. Okay, we can see here in this picture where these teeth, like in a, in a child, are kind of held, right? So if this was a baby or a, a child, uh, once they lose this tooth, this next tooth is right there to move in, and all it does is move down the 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 surface of the bone okay and and protrude through the gum okay uh babies have 20 teeth okay we said that before 10 on the bottom 10 on the top teeth develop beneath the gums and erupt in a predictable order okay so we we kind of know as as doctors and scientists what teeth are supposed to come first what teeth usually come second in babies and for the most part they're pretty accurate they begin erupting around six to 30 months. And if anybody you know, in watching this has children, you know that uh, teething is gonna be the one thing that, that really messes up your early sleeping patterns of your children. Okay, children, uh, newborns especially, it's hard for them to get into a sleep, up a routine for sleep. Okay, and, and as a parent, you, you typically get this done between like months four and, and six okay by by month three or four you should have your kid um kind of routinely sleeping at, at the same times every day okay and then as soon as you get them into a routine that you feel comfortable with the teeth start erupting through the gums and it's and it's very painful for them okay it's painful for it would be painful for an adult never mind uh you know a little baby that that doesn't know what pain is yet right and they don't know what this feeling is. So they're being woken up constantly. You constantly have to give them Tylenol or, or Advil or whatever to kill the pain. Okay. And then, and, and it, it never seems to really work until, you know, the, the, the first four or five sets of teeth come in. Okay. And then, uh, then you can go back to some type of normalcy. Okay. So between six and 25 years of age, all 32 or all uh, 20 uh, deciduous bones are replaced by 32 permanent teeth. Your wisdom teeth or your third molars erupt between ages 17 to 25. Mine happened around age 25, so they, it could happen really late. Um, there's a chance that they can become impacted. What that means is they aren't coming straight downwards. Okay, sometimes your wisdom teeth can grow um, like facing the outside of your mouth, right? And and that that's going to push instead of them pushing downward into your out of your gums. They're pushing forward into the teeth that are already there, right? So if I go back to this picture, okay, this wisdom tooth here, it's pointing up. And when it erupts through this gum, this portion of this tooth could hit the this portion of that tooth. This one, it might be, they might be able to get away with having that wisdom tooth. But let's make believe that wisdom tooth isn't pointing in that necessarily nice upward direction. Let's say that wisdom tooth is pointing more this way, okay? And when it erupts, it's gonna erupt in this direction, which is gonna push on this tooth, which is gonna push on that tooth, which is gonna push on that tooth, and it's gonna cause pain, it's gonna cause a shift in your teeth, and it could potentially become infected, 
okay, depending on what happens and how you take care of it. Um, but if the worst, uh, least case scenario, best case scenario is that your teeth get shifted, okay, and, and put out of alignment, so to speak. Okay, but that's not something you want either. Okay, the human mouth is home to 700 different species of microorganism, uh, most of which are bacteria. Okay, plaque is the sticky residue on the teeth made up of bacteria and sugars. So uh, that little white pasty stuff on your teeth that you find in between your teeth or in, in your gums at the base of the gums where it meets the teeth, uh, the, the gingival sulcus, okay, that is called plaque. When that plaque becomes calcified and hardened, we call it calculus, okay? Um, bacteria, when they eat sugars, are going to produce different acids, okay, as like a waste product. And those acids uh, will uh, sit on top of the enamel of the tooth and eat away at the enamel of the tooth, okay? Um, and that can cause cavities. That's why it's important to brush before bed, okay? If you leave sugars sitting on your teeth before you go to sleep, the bacteria in your mouth will eat those sugars, produce acids as uh, byproducts or waste products of fermentation, and it will give you cavities, okay, or, or potentially give you cavities. And a root canal, uh, we said a root canal is when, um, well, we saw what the root was, that's where the veins, arteries, and nerves are, but a root canal therapy, okay, the, the actual procedure uh, is what happens when the cavity in the enamel actually reaches the pulp of the tooth. So when that when that cavity reaches down here, that's a pretty big cavity. Okay, uh, that's when a root canal is uh, necessary. Okay, what does that calculus do? What does that hard plaque do? That hard plaque wedges uh, between the tooth and the gum, and it it kind of causes a separation um, between the tooth and gum. And when you have a separation, that's going to allow uh, bacterial invasions to, to occur. So bacteria can get in to your gums, okay, if that occurs. And if that does occur, you will end up with something called gingivitis. Gingivitis is the inflammation of your gums or your gingiva, right? Anytime you see itis, it means inflammation. That is the inflammation of your gums. Um, if you have jaw issues, if you have uh, deterioration of the jaw or your mandible or maxilla, okay, if you have um, cancer in your jaw, okay, the actual bones, that is called periodontal disease, okay, so you go to a periodontist if you're, if the bone is giving you an issue, okay, um, a lot of times periodontal disease will result in the loss of a tooth, Chewing, okay, uh, the, the actual uh, act of chewing is called mastication. It's the breaking up of uh, food particles um, into smaller pieces that can be swallowed and exposed to different enzymes. Okay, the first step of mastication is to mechanically digest, to actually chew the food into smaller pieces. Um, that food will actually stimulate receptors that trigger an involuntary chewing reflex. So you will chew this, you will chew the same amount of times every time you chew something. You don't know you do it. You're unaware of it. Uh, you think that you might chew things differently depending on what they are, but you actually don't. Okay. You're a creature of habit, just like any other um, species. And you tend to make patterns and, and have rhythms and you will chew things the same way over and over and over again, no matter um, what, because that's just how your, your brain is working. Okay, the tongue, the buccinator, and the obicularis oris are all going to help manipulate food. Okay, those are all muscles of the mouth. We call those muscles of mastication, right? The masseter and the temporalis elevate the lower teeth to crush food. Okay, so the tongue, the buccinator, and the obicularis oris, they're going to move food around. That's what manipulate food means. Okay, but the masseter, the temporalis, uh, those two muscles are actually going to move the jaw up and down. Right. So it's one thing to move to be able to move your food from side to side. It's also another thing to move your jaw up and down so that you can actually mechanically digest food. OK, uh, the medial and, la and lateral pterygoid muscles. OK, it's a silent P there. So it's just pterygoid. OK, the medial and lateral pterygoid muscles and the masseter muscle, which is another big muscle on your cheek. OK, that swings teeth side to side. OK, and makes you allows you to grind things. Okay, so you tear stuff off with the front teeth, 
you move it to the back where you then grind it up into smaller portions that you can uh, eventually swallow. Okay. In your mouth, you have enzymes. Like I, I've said a bunch of times already in this lecture, uh, one of them is called salivary amylase. Anytime you see the, the letters A, S, E at the end of a word, okay, ACE, ACE always means that it's an enzyme. So you can have amylase, you can have uh, galactase, uh, you can have lactase, you can have uh, polymerase, you can have ligase, all these different things that end in ASE are all enzymes or they're all uh, chemicals that um, allow reactions to happen, right? What does salivary amylase do or saliva, right? That's the, that's the technical term or the, the layman's terms, saliva. Okay, salivary amylase. It moistens the mouth. It begins starch and fat digestion. Okay, that's evident because like if you have a suck candy in your mouth, you don't have to chew it. It'll just dissolve on its own. And that's because salivary amylase in your mouth is um, digesting st uh, starch or sugars. It helps to clean your teeth. It helps to inhibit bacterial growth because of its pH. It helps to dissolve molecules so that they can stimulate your taste buds. And it moistens food and binds it together into something called a bolus. A bolus is that big piece of uh, chewed food that you have. Okay, whatever that bundle of food is. Okay, if you took a bite of a sandwich, that bolus is made of bread and and cold cuts and uh, mayonnaise or you know tomato, whatever it is you put on your sandwich. All that stuff mushed up into a ball in your mouth is called a bolus. Okay. You have lots of different uh, salivary glands in the mouth, okay? Uh, the intrinsic ones, um, these are small glands dispersed amid other oral tissue, so they're embedded in the tissue of your oral cavity, okay? You have linguinal glands in the tongue that, that help to break down fats, lipase, okay? Lipase means an enzyme that brings down lipids, okay? You have labial glands inside of the lips. You have palatine glands at the roof of your mouth. You have buccal glands in your cheeks, okay? They all are going to produce saliva uh, pretty, pretty constantly almost, but much, much more when you're, when you're chewing or eating something. But then you have extrinsic salivary glands, which are going to be um, external. They're not going to be embedded necessarily in tissue. They might lay on top of tissue, okay? Things like that. Uh, you have three pairs connected to your oral cavity. Uh, the, the parotid glands are located beneath the skin anterior to the earlobe. So they're pretty far back in your throat. Okay. Um, people that have the mumps have uh, swollen parotid glands. Okay. Mumps are when your cheeks swell up really big. Uh, the submandibular glands, sub means underneath, mandibular means uh, mandible, right? So it's underneath the mandible. Uh, it's located halfway along the body of the mandible, and its duct empties out uh, at the side of the linguinal frenulum. So it's it's going to you know, line the the middle part of your jaw, but it's going to secrete its enzymes underneath the front of your tongue. And then you have the sublinguinal gland, which is located in the floor of the mouth, and has multiple ducts that empty posterior to the papilla of the submandibular duct. Okay, so it's uh, the glands underneath your tongue and it, it releases enzymes underneath your tongue. Okay, that's what that means. Okay, here we have a picture of the different uh, things. Here's the masseter muscle, this big cheek muscle that you have. Okay, this is the lower jaw and on top of his lower jaw, he would have all his teeth. Okay, but this is showing you the frenulum, the piece that connects the tongue to the, to the floor of the mouth. We have our mandible here, this piece of, uh, of a bone. We have our sublinguinal gland. If you take a look, all the glands kind of look like fat tissue, but they're not. Okay, you have your sublingual gland, you have your submandibular gland. Okay. Sorry, and the parotid glands in the back. Okay. Okay, let's talk about the pharynx, and then we're going to talk about um, uh, swallowing, and then we'll call it a, a day for this lecture. Okay, the pharynx is a muscular funnel that connects the oral cavity to the esophagus, okay? So your mouth is connected to your throat through the pharynx, okay? 
this is where the digestive and respiratory tracts are going to intersect. So this is where like um, the the mouth uh, eventually has to become the trachea and the mouth eventually has to, or the throat has to become the esophagus. And this is where it happens. The pharynx is, is that fork in the road, so to speak, right? So you have your mouth here. And then once you swallow things, uh, you have two options that that passageway can go one way and go into your esophagus and go into your stomach and be the digestive system or that stuff can go straight down into the trachea and into the lungs okay we don't want food in our lungs so hopefully that doesn't happen okay uh, the esophagus is a straight muscular tube around 25 to 30 centimeters. That's about a 12 inch ruler. Okay, 30 centimeters is 12 inches. Okay, it begins at C6, which is cervical vertebrae oops, number six. Okay, that's usually where the esophagus begins. It extends from the pharynx to the cardial orifice. That is a fancy way of saying the stomach. Okay, the beginning of the stomach. And it passes through the esophageal hiatus. The esophageal hiatus is a hole that's in the diaphragm. Okay, here's your diaphragm, this kind of big arced muscle. Okay, your esophagus has to go through that in order to get to the stomach, which is over here. Okay, the hole here where the um, esophagus goes through the diaphragm, that's called the esophageal hiatus. Okay. Uh, the lower esophageal sphincter, so if we have our esophagus here, there's a circular muscle at the bottom that allows food to pass through and go into the stomach. Okay. Uh, that lower esophageal sphincter uh, pauses because of constriction, and that can allow things to go down into the stomach, but it doesn't want stuff going up back into it. Okay. We don't want our stomach juices to go up into our esophagus. Yeah, because the stomach juices can deteriorate our esophagus. We don't want that. Okay. What do you call that when that happens? What do you call uh, when the stomach acids get into your stomach? We call that indigestion or heartburn. Okay. Swallowing occurs in three phases. The first phase is called the oral phase, and that is completely voluntary. You actually think about the uh, swallowing of food the entire time. And what happens is the, the tongue collects food, presses it against the palate of your mouth, against the top of your mouth, and that forms our bolus. Okay, that forms the bolus, which you eventually will swallow. And then the tongue pushes that bolus backwards towards the back of your mouth. That food, that bolus, will accumulate in the oropharynx, which is the very back last portion of your mouth, but it's in front of the epiglottis. And then once that food gets pushed back far enough, it's going to hit the epiglottis, cause the epiglottis to, to move backwards and close the, lar the laryngopharynx. Okay, so let's take a, I have a picture of this. I'm not going to bother trying to draw it because I'm going to draw it poorly. And I'll just show you a picture of it. Okay, so here is the mouth. This is the tongue. Let me get a different color here so you can see it. Okay, this is the tongue, this whole piece here. Okay, this is food. This big green thing is food. This is the epiglottis. Okay, when food is uh, going to be swallowed, the tongue pushes up, pushes all that food up. This, that upward motion causes this ball of food to be made. That ball of food goes into the oropharynx right here. And then once that food hits the, the epiglottis, the epiglottis is going to fold downwards in this direction to close this passageway off. This passageway is called the trachea. We do not want food to get into the trachea, okay? We want food to continue down this path, which is the esophagus, which will eventually lead to the stomach down there. Okay, so we want that food to go through the oral canal, trigger the epiglottis to close this respiratory tract. And for a moment, you can't breathe, right? While that epiglottis is pushed over the trachea, you're not breathing, So, but it's only a, a slight you know, portion of a second. 
and then that food can then pass down the opposite, uh, the other way. Okay, the next phase after the oral phase is called the pharyngeal phase, which is involuntary. This happens without you having to think about it. This prevents food from re-entering the mouth or entering the nasal cavity. Uh, at this point, breathing is suspended because your trachea is covered momentarily while the bolus is pushed past it. Okay, muscles pull the larynx up to meet the epiglottis and cover the opening. Your vocal cords actually adduct and close their airway. We learned about that last week. And the bolus is driven downward by constriction of the upper and middle uh, and finally lower pharyngeal constrictors. Okay, so the food is pushed down into the um, esophagus. Okay, so this is the pharyngeal phase. Okay, we can see the food getting pushed down here. You can see the epiglottis closing off the airway and food slipping down behind it. Okay, the esophageal phase is the last phase of swallowing. And a big part of this esophageal phase is this idea of peristalsis. And we have to make sure we know this word. Peristalsis is the involuntary wave of muscular contractions that pushes the bolus ahead of it. So in order to go against gravity when you're laying down or if, if you were on your side, you still want to be able to digest and do things. So besides, uh, regardless of what position you're in in your body, you need that food to go against gravity sometimes. And that's what peristalsis does. It's this involuntary wave of muscle contractions over your entire digestive system all this all the time so that the food can move out of you uh, in a timely manner okay you want that food to get out of you in a couple of hours you don't want food hanging around and be constipated you want to you don't want to not go because you're dehydrated because you have diarrhea or something like that those are two things you don't want okay but peristalsis will uh, help you get that bolus around your body okay Okay, here is the esophagus, and you can see the arrows pointing in and pointing out. Those are uh, telling you that peristalsis is happening. So, all right, so this, it's, oh, let me go back. It's a wave, okay? You, you have this wave of, of energy that's contracting through these tissues and pushes. It's like almost like, you know, if you, if you grab toothpaste by the end and you push the toothpaste out, um, but instead of just, you know, sliding your fingers across to let the, the toothpaste out, it's like, you, you know, you hold the back of the toothpaste and you squeeze it and you go up a little more and you squeeze it and then you go up a little more and you squeeze it. That's kind of what's happening here. That's, that's what peristalsis is. Okay. It's this constant rhythmic contraction of the smooth muscle of your digestive system. That's going to help you die, uh, get this food around the body. Okay. And that is where we are going to end for today. We're going to end with swallowing. And then next lecture, we will continue with the stomach. Okay, everyone. So I will see you next lecture. Ciao.